I'm thrilled to welcome Julia and Anita from WSP. If you aren't familiar with WSP, they're one of the largest sustainability consulting firms in the world with over 5,000 multidisciplinary sustainable energy, environmental, and climate change experts. So welcome to Julia and Anita, and I'm excited to hear their talk this morning. Hi, my name is Anita Schwartz, and I am a senior uh, director with WSP. I'm here with Julie Sinistori, and we're here to talk about packaging. Um, we want to talk about why your packaging may be in the doghouse, and really the truth behind when your recyclable packaging isn't really recyclable. So we're going to cover a few different topics today. Uh, we want to talk about the background around plastics. Um, types of plastics provide you a case study of a client that we worked with on their recycling journey, and then tell you a little bit about the truth of what really happens with packaging in the recycling infrastructure. Of course, we'll leave some time for questions as well. We want to be leaving you with some outcomes in terms of understanding the ecology of plastics and the benefits and considerations, and also equip you with the right types of questions to be asking your packaging designers, your marketing department, as well as your customers. All right, I'm Julie Sinistori, and I want to first start off with some background about plastics. Well, it's pretty obvious they're everywhere. And they're everywhere for a lot of good reasons because they have benefits like protecting products from spoilage and destruction. They're very lightweight in transport. They're very durable. They're cost-effective and they have some temperature resistance properties. But some considerations about them is that not all plastics are recyclable, especially things like multi-layer packaging where there's layers of plastics and metals intertwined. That can be very difficult to recycle and there's issues that have arisen in the last couple of years about ocean plastics and, of course, the persistence of plastics in landfill, which affect customers' perceptions of products that are packaged in plastics. Now, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, there are many different types of plastics. Here's a quick high-level cheat sheet about all the different types and how they differ in their applications and their abilities, especially when it comes to packaging different types of food products. But what I wanna really call attention to is just because a product has a chasing arrow symbol on the bottom of it, doesn't mean that it's necessarily recyclable. And that's for a number of reasons. So again, and here's another bit of a cheat sheet about the material attributes and general recyclability or other types of end of life considerations about different types of plastics. So along the left here, we have the materials attribute about whether it's recyclable, biodegradable, or compostable. And along the top is a column for if the product is bio-based, as in made of plants, or fossil-based, as in made of fossil fuels. So first off, we have uh, in the top left, the bio-based yet also recyclable plastics. Now these are chemically identical to fossil plastic, which means that they can be recycled. An example of this is the Dasani plant bottle, but most converters won't actually accept these for a variety of reasons. The second category we have are the biodegradable made of bio-based plants plastics. Now biodegradable means that in the presence of certain conditions around temperature and humidity and microorganisms, this material can be broken down into water, biomass, and gases like carbon dioxide and methane, but only in the proper conditions. Now, a, a bio-based plastic like a starch-based PLA is not recyclable, and it may say things like biodegradable or compostable on the product. The difficulty is that often these look just like regular plastics, and so they can be incorrectly put into the recycling bin or put into the compost bin in areas where they actually won't be composted for a variety of reasons. Where if composting is not actually accepted in that area, the proper place to put that plastic is actually in the garbage. Now, compostable is actually a subset of biodegradable. This subset means that the 
material will break down safely into water and biomass and gases under very, very specific composting conditions between 55 and 70 degrees Celsius. Again, these are also not recyclable. And generally, both the biodegradable and the compostable subsets must be put into some sort of industrial composting conditions where temperature and humidity are closely regulated. And they may not and probably will not break down in home composting. And they definitely will not break down when they make it into the cold, salty ocean. So let's go over to the fossil side. Here we've got our standard plastics, which we talked about before. There are many different types. Some are more readily recyclable than others. Then we've got this interesting fossil-based, but also biodegradable section. This is where an additive, a polyester amide, has been added to make an oxobiodegradable plastic. Now, what that means is that, again, it's made from fossil fuels, but in the presence of certain conditions, it will break down. And generally, what it does is just break down into smaller and smaller pieces. Now, there are some issues with this because these pieces can also continue to persist, for example, in ocean atmospheres. But then also, the methane that is released, not only from these oxobiodegradable plastics, but also from those other biodegradable and compostable plastics, if that methane is released in a landfill, it is 25 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, so it contributes more to climate change. And while 18% of U.S. landfills do have methane gas captured, that leaves the majority of U.S. landfills not having that, which means that that methane is released directly to the atmosphere, contributing to climate change. So generally, this is a very complicated space um, and it's very important to understand what all these different terms mean and what the actual end of life of a particular material will be. Thank you, Julie, for that example of the different types of plastics, as well as some of the more nuanced uh, and new trends in plastic innovation. Um, I want to focus on you know, traditional fossil-based plastics with the next uh, couple of slides to talk a bit about really what those variable conditions are and what makes something really truly recoverable and recyclable. Um, recycling is the process of being able to collect material, aggregate it, and then reprocess it and bring it back into the supply chain. There has to be an economic driver to really kind of have all of those components aligned. So materials like number one plastic or PET, HDPE, um, plastic film, and polypropylene do have end markets. Um, our recycling rate for these types of materials, these are 2018 numbers from uh, the EPA, um, and these are actually attributed to the recovery rate of plastics attributed to packaging from residential collection. What this represents is that our ability to really capture good quality plastic material and bring that back into the supply chain isn't that great right now. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue down this path. There are some trends that are indicating that there will be um, some forward trajectory in terms of the ability to recycle more and recycle better. Um, so some trends are indicating that there is infrastructure investment. So a lot of uh, newer material recovery facilities are investing in um, more technology like um, robotics to be able to separate material that has those commodity values and bring that material back in to su the supply chain. Um, there's also an effort for reduced contamination and that really looks at how do we educate the public in terms of how to recycle right uh, in terms of the types of materials that do have those commodity values, how to not contaminate the stream which adds cost um, ultimately to the recycling infrastructure by making sure that the right material goes into the right bin. And then there's also uh, legislation that's coming down the pipe. Um, EU, the um, European Union, has been really leading the charge in terms of legislation. And some of the initiatives that they have driven are around virgin plastic tax. So if uh, a manufacturer chooses to use a virgin-based material, there is an associated tax with that. 
They are also requiring a certain percentage of post con recycled content uh, in packaging, and that was the goals are 25% uh, by 2025 and 30% post consumer recycled content by 2030. Um, they also have and have had a long history of extended producer responsibility initiatives to make sure that manufacturers are able to either be responsible for the end of life solution for the packaging that they produce um, or have the systems to be able to recover those packaging uh, items. The same type of legislation is now being introduced in the US. A lot of municipalities are evaluating their uh, next generation goals around municipal collection um, and recycling goals where it's not only ban based. So you see a lot of cities that are doing plastic bans, but then also integrating some of these additional components around extended producer responsibility and potentially looking at how to uh, require some sort of post consumer recycle content in packaging and products. So many of you may have heard about um, chemical recycling, and this is something that is um, being talked about in the industry right now in regards to uh, sort of new technologies on making uh, plastics and converting plastics back to their building blocks. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, there is sort of an ecosystem around collecting, aggregating, and then redistributing these materials into the supply chain. Um, so the processing capabilities for mechanical recycling is what we're used to now, where we collect it, we send it to a materials recovery facility, it is sorted either mechanically or even sometimes manually, and then it goes to a plastics converter or a paper pulper or a metal recycler, and then that material is brought back into the supply chain. What chemical recycling does is it builds, it breaks that plastic back down into its, um, its chemical components. Um, there are different uh, processing uh, capabilities from those basic chemical building blocks. Uh, it can go back into fuel, which is through pyrolysis. So from a fuel-based product back into a fuel-based um, byproduct. Um, gasification takes those basic building blocks and converts them into uh, chemicals. Uh, so it can go into further processing into different types of end products. And then chemical depolymerization, again, also takes those building blocks of that uh, fossil-based plastic, and then they're able to produce additional different types of products from that. Um, these are newer uh, approaches in terms of recycling and really using those materials. But where we have sort of a scalability issue is really on that collection aggregation and then the distribution into these types of uh, technologies. Um, there's a cost associated with that. And then there's also a, a large cost associated with the processing technology itself. So from a scalability perspective, we're not quite there yet. Um, so when we're thinking about packaging decisions, it's really important to think through what those end of life solutions are, what's really scalable today, and ultimately where your packaging is going to go um, once you're producing it and the consumer is done using it. So Julie's going to talk a bit about what that really looks like in real life when making those packaging decisions. Thanks, Anita. So I'd like to share with you a case study of a client that we recently supported in trying to understand the best way to deal with their product made from PET plastic at its end of life. And something they are very interested in and very passionate about is this idea of fully closed loop, meaning making all of their new plastic products out of their old plastic products, their exact old plastic products, which sounds great, right? Sounds like the definition of the circular economy. So what they wanted to understand though, is that this requires a lot of transportation because they produce their, their, their products in one part of the country and then ship them to other parts of the country for use, and then would have to reverse ship them back to be able to make new products out of the old products. So we developed three scenarios for them to understand the greenhouse gas emission impacts of this transportation around different methods of using recycled content to make their new products. Now, scenario one is fully closed loop, that their, their customers use the product, send it right back to where they then recycle it and make new product out of it. In the second scenario, 
their clients are still sending the products back to them, but then they sell that to be recycled locally and then incorporate into their production process as much recycled PET, regardless of the source, as possible. And then the third scenario is they ensure that their customers are able to recycle their products locally exactly where they're being used on the East Coast and the West Coast and in the Midwest. And then their manufacturer of the new products sources as much post-consumer content recycled plastic as possible, again, regardless of source. And to cut right to the punchline here, the third scenario that avoids as much of the transportation as possible had the lowest greenhouse gas emissions. Now they expected this to some extent, but they didn't expect, I don't think that it would be quite as dramatic of a difference. So the first scenario, the fully closed loop scenario actually resulted in quite a lot of greenhouse gas emissions around transportation of the products back to their original point of production. And essentially the way to avoid the most greenhouse gas emissions would be to make sure that the products are recycled locally and make new products out of locally sourced recycled materials close by to the manufacturing facility. And so this case study really highlights some of the unintended consequences around trying to fully close your loop in making your new products out of your exact old products. Whereas potentially just trying to ensure that your products definitely are recycled where they're used and sourcing post-consumer content recycled plastic to make your new products will actually avoid all of this transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. And Anita is going to now elaborate further on some of these considerations. Thanks, Julie. Um, so I wanted to sort of give you some examples of what's happening in the industry across the board with plastic commitments um, that organizations are making. As You So is an NGO and they had uh, put out a report. I have a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, when you get the uh, PDF version, you'll be able to look at it a little bit more. Um, but it's a report where they aggregated about 50 consumer brands that have made commitments to reducing plastic uh, waste. And they evaluated their performance from their 2017, 2018 goals um, to 2020 around six different pillars. Um, so packaging design, reusable packaging, recycled content, transparency around packaging, supporting the recycling infrastructure, and producer responsibility. And you know, you can see um, of the 50 companies that were evaluated, only one received a B minus score, and that was the highest score. The larger portion of the companies that were evaluated ended up in the D and F categories. And these are large consumer brands like Unilever, PepsiCo, um, Kraft Heinz. And it, it is indicative of the um, idea that it is important to set goals and it is important to make commitment to move the needle on plastic packaging, but it's not easy to move and, and turn on a dime. And so it really does take sort of a step-by-step -step process and also integrating your initiatives with your industry to be able to really move forward collectively to address this issue. So we wanted to leave you with some ground truthing in terms of what you can do to sort of move the needle with your plastic packaging. Um, so as we mentioned, end market demand is really critical. Um, so the sort of global policies that had happened in 2017 and 2018 really limited um, and actually uh, completely uh, destroyed <laughs> global trade of scrap material to other countries from the US and Europe into other countries where it was going to be processed and then reused um, in the recycling industry. And so what that did was really sort of uh, put the mirror on the recycling industry to say that it was an unsustainable model. And so domestic and market uh, processing for plastics and pulp um, and metals is really a growing market. And so to help end market demand, um, you have the ability to use more post-consumer recycled content in your packaging. Not only does it help you bolster the ability to process that plastic or that material domestically, but it also gives you an opportunity to create the um, supply chain that you need for post-consumer recycled content. Um, the other 
thing that we can do to, to Julie's point about the case study is to find local resources, finding local recycling converters, and then also sourcing that recycled content from your packaging manufacturer, whoever's near your packaging manufacturer. So not trying to create um, too much distance between where you're recycling and where you're sourcing. Clear, concise recycling information for your consumer um, will also help mitigate some of the contamination issues, but then also be able to help provide information that how your material can be recycled. It also helps you evaluate the types of materials that you're choosing so that you know what the end life um, disposition is going to be for that packaging format. Take back programs is another way. If there's not local infrastructure to collect that packaging material from a curbside collection um, program, um, you can work with competitors, work with your retailers to maximize the collection of those hard to recycle materials and then effectively collaborate um, and then increase that availability of that post-consumer recycle content in the marketplace as well. And then lastly is to work with your legislators, um, either through your industry groups or even as individuals to help create policies that favor recycling in terms of collection capabilities, um, infrastructure development, policies, um, I would say more not on bans per se, but really increasing what is necessary for consumer um, content, post-consumer content in packaging. So we appreciate your time for listening to us uh, talk a bit about your packaging and why it might be in the doghouse today, but out and out of the doghouse tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> we've left a few different resources here for you and of course, some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, Anita and Julia. Thank you so much for that a really wonderful presentation and for joining us today uh, for Q&A. Um, our chat box is literally exploding with questions uh, for you ladies. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I've summarized a couple and I'm gonna get to as much as we can. However, I also want to offer to all of our attendance members um, that, um, as leading the PSC plastics work uh, and packaging work, I will be in the PSC booth um, after this talk to answer any questions uh, that we don't get to. So Julie, Anita, I've, we've got a really great question that I'm really excited to get your point of view. As companies are considering packaging decisions and as companies are considering commitments with the, with the disparity of kind of 100% recyclable versus what is actually getting recycled, what is your recommendations or do we set aspirational goals and kind of try to inspire our consumers to get that recycling rate up or with the low recycling rate do we you know just we don't even worry about it I, I think it would be beneficial for packaging designers to consider the types of packaging materials that they're selecting and um, when we talk about something being recyclable it is it is able to be recovered in over 60% of markets domestically in the US when making that claim in, in a domestic uh, scenario. Um, so I think that it would be most beneficial for packaging designer to consider their material palette and, and packaging format. And then that can then be communicated to the consumer to mitigate contamination. I think that our recycling rates are low um, because there is a uh, sort of miscommunication between what is recyclable and what we want to be recyclable. So there's a lot of wish cycling that happens. And so by making sure that your material palette is truly recoverable in a large portion of the country, and then to be able to communicate that effectively to your consumer, that's really going to have the best outcome in terms of recovery as well as true recyclability. We're getting a lot of questions about what happens in U.S. versus EU. Um, for example, one of our packaging suppliers says they're able uh, to uh, package their PP in uh, several different countries in the EU. Um, I know they're pretty different uh, situations when it comes to end of life across the world. Do you see kind of a joining together of there's going to be kind of more union between North America and EU when it comes to end of life? Or do you really think in kind of the next five to 10 year horizon, there's going to remain pretty separate markets? I think um, legislation is really going to drive some of those initiatives. And so 
um, depending on you know the ability to to move forward certain legislative initiatives is going to be really sort of that critical uh, mass of what happens between you know domestically North America uh, and domestically in the European Union. Um, recycling and waste is it tends to be legislatively a very localized policy making process. So when we look at a lot of the legislation that happens around waste, it is driven by the municipality or at a state level. There's very little federal regulation around waste and recycling. And so there has to be some sort of either transition in terms of a national perspective on waste and recycling, or there has to be enough legislation um, and lobbying by the public to really sort of instigate that type of initiative. Um, so that's really where those limitations lie, whereas with EU, because there is a network of organizations and member countries, it's a little bit uh, easier in that respect to be able to pass legislation that has broad sweeping effect across an entire region. Um, so that being said, I think you know one of the points that I made in the talk was that if you have lobbying capabilities or you have you know the ability to get engaged um, with legislation, that's really sort of a, an opportunity to kind of indicate that there is a need for this type of uh, broader reach, either you know at a federal level or more broadly at state levels. For organizations that want to get uh, a part of that. Um legislative process, I'm going to really encourage you to stay tuned to our collaborative panel where we'll have several organizations um, that we're talking about be able to do that. So one last question uh, for you ladies. Uh, we're still educating and we're all still learning together what the different kinds of recycling are. At the same time, we have a lot of companies who are making kind of broad overreaching PCR commitments. So when we talk about that uh, post-consumer content, where do you ladies think that post-consumer content will come from? Will it become from chemical? Will it come from mechanical? Um, or what are those streams as we try and reach those PCR commitments. Do you want me to take this one? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think it's going to it's going to be a mix. We could be expecting to see more post-consumer content coming from mechanical as those streams get cleaned up as there's more attention being paid to leveraging the infrastructure that we already have. I think chemical recycling could play a very really key role in the future because it opens a lot of doors to using a lot of streams that aren't currently being used, but I think it's still uh, a ways down the road. So in the near term, I would expect it would more come from the classic uh, mechanical sources. Thank you, ladies. Once again, Julia and Nita, thank you so much for your time and knowledge today.